Hello, and welcome to Creepy Core and Folklore, the show about creatures, encounters, old tales, and myths. I'm your host, Iona Wayland, a dark fantasy author, mental health professional, and overall curious person. I want to join other spooky souls and hear about these unusual stories. I'm very excited for episode five and the reason I'm excited, I mean, I'm excited for each episode, but this one's extra special because it's based off of what's going on in my life right now, where I'm going to dedicate this episode to cats. And the reason for this inspiration with cats is because we added one more kitty to our family yesterday. Um, I guess by the time this comes out, it'll be a while that he's been with us, but he's actually sitting on my lap right now. His name's Kachu, um, and I'm going to try and record some of his purring because he's just a loud purr box on my lap right now. He's a bit ridiculous, so let me describe him to you. He is a rather large-ish um, Persian cat. He has a very flat face. It goes eyeball, nose, eyeball in a row, and then a huge chin. <laughs> um, he's very fluffy, although um, before I got him, the person that had him before um, got him a lion cut, which is a type of cat grooming haircut where the feet and the tail and the head stay long, so kind of looks like a lion, but his body's shaved, and he kind of looks ridiculous, because his head is already pretty humongous, um, and then with the puff just being left there, it's a little silly, so I'm going to make sure when this comes out that I post, um, like, some images of him or a video of him so that people can see what he looks like, and I'll make sure I put that on the, um, creepy core and folklore Instagram a little house pretty rural with some land on it so we kind of have a farmette ish kind of thing we have 12 chickens we have four dogs and now we have three cats we also have two horses um and every animal that we have um aside from one and the chickens are kind of like more of a barter and trade type of situation. Um, but the there's only like one dog that's not a rescue, but I still consider him a rescue. It just wasn't through a particular, like it wasn't through an actual like ASPCA or organization of some sort. But Kachu came to us because um, his owner uh, gave him up because where that person was moving Uh, They weren't able to take him with them for whatever reason. He went to this person that owns a rescue. Um, It's actually a rescue where I've worked before. And she just let me have him. um, Because I've actually known him since he was six months old. Um, He used to belong to a person that I watched their farm while they would go on like vacations or need a break or had medical procedures done. And so I think with the move, they were downsizing animals as well. And I understand that with different life scenarios, it might cause um, people to have to shift their animal ownership over to make sure that they're giving their animals the best home possible. So I don't know, I'm just kind of torn because I've known this cat on and off since he was six months old. And like he was bought, I believe from a breeder. So that they have his like, his like papers and stuff. He's like the fanciest cat I've ever owned. Um, I don't know, but he's pretty thin. Um, not scarily thin, but enough that he certainly needs to gain weight and he also has some ear mites going on um and I'm pretty sure that there's um Persians are like prone to uh, a kidney a particular kind of kidney disorder 
It's called polycystic kidney disease, and I want to get him checked for that because there's just some bathroom habits that aren't bad. There's like nothing. There's been no accidents or anything like that, but I just see like kind of a a strange consistency. So I just want to get him checked for things like that. So he's going to be on the mend because he needs a little TLC right now. Um, And he's just a really good snuggle buddy. I learned lots about the Persian like when I first started working with him because I'd never seen one before. Um, And now that he's living with us to prepare for that, I wanted to make sure I was educated as I can about it. And one of my things that I do is I do deep dives into things. And While I was doing this deep dive, of course, I looked at mythologies and folklore surrounding cats. So that's what led us to today's episode. Although I'm sorry, now I've started talking about cats. I want to give you like a brief rundown of each of the cats. So first I had, um, well, even before I had indoor cats, I used to do a trap neuter release program where I would just like set out um, raccoon, humane raccoon traps and capture local alley cats when I lived more in a city. And I would trap, neuter and release them. Um, But and, and I come from sort of like farm country. Well, I know I've brought it up in episodes before. Some of my life was like rooted in Appalachia. And some of my life was rooted in um, inner city, um, simultaneously because, you know, broken families, uh, cause diverse childhoods with a range, I'll say, <laughs> of experiences. Um, so I've been very into cats. I, I love cats. I love dogs. I love all animals. Like I love my horses. Chickens are ridiculously hilarious, but I still remember someone being like, you can't love cats and dogs equally. And like says who, like, just cause you have a preference and it's totally fine if someone has a preference for like, I'm more of a cat person. I'm more of a dog person, whatever. But I like both. I like both and no one can tell me that that's not okay because it totally is but the cats that are part of our family as of right now are Pearl who is a big chunk a chunk she is a um Torby uh which is a tortoise shell mixed with a tabby she's beautifully pink and chunky um she came from a I adopted her from a Um, cat hoarding type situation there's a whole story um, behind that because I even though it was through a rescue she like where she lived before was not too far from where I lived I just didn't know it so that was pretty interesting then there's cranberry she's a black long-haired cat Um, we found her by accident like almost hitting her with um, my husband's car because she chased a napkin into the middle of the road. She was on a really busy road and we didn't hit her luckily. Um, But we saw her scamper away and we quick zoomed around and um, I followed her into a skate park. um, And I got like profiled by the police, even though I was like not doing anything. It was very weird. It was not a good time. Um, but luckily we sorted that out. I'm like, I swear to God, I'm looking for a kitten. (laughs) You can come with us if you want. And so I was, what I did was I played, um, a, uh, mom cat calling to her baby cats, uh, from a YouTube video. And, uh, it got her to come to us and I caught her and um, she's actually just recently getting fixed. So that's really good because we've found her during the height of the pandemic and I wasn't able to take her to any um, vets right away. I had to do like little clinics to make sure she had like her shots and things like that, but I wasn't able to schedule her for a surgery until recently. Um, But the reason her name's Cranberry is because the song that was playing when we almost hit her and then when we turned around and tried to find a parking spot and then dove into the bushes basically to get her um, was Zombie by the Cranberries. So I thought that was cute. Um, And then Kachu, I shared his story. And because he's this giant fluffy white cat, the farmer that used to own him uh, named him Kachu because it looks like he's like gonna sneeze like I don't know like look I don't know how to explain other than like looking at him 
makes you feel like you're going to sneeze um, because he's just so fluffy. He looks like a giant pile of Kleenexes. I don't know. I'm just going to have to post a picture of him and you'll have to see what I, ne- I mean because saying a cat looks like a sneeze is a little ridiculous. I also forgot to mention that what adds to his ridiculous appearance not only is the very odd line cut on his giant squished head, but he has a bit of an underbite, which a lot of them do. Um, but he has a snaggle tooth um, that like really just sets him apart and adds character. <laughs> um, he's very, very sweet. So I'll stop gushing about him and I will I'll stop gushing about all my animals, I guess, eventually. Actually, that's not true. I'm not going to promise anything because I just can't stop talking about my animals. (laughs) Um, But I'm going to talk about some of the myths and kind of like urban legends surrounding cats. So most of the things I've found were folklore-esque, but also more superstitions. Um, It was one of those things where I could have kept digging and digging and digging, and I will, honestly, Um, but I wanted to keep um, things somewhat consistent where I just hit on folklore and superstitious tales. Um, But the first one that showed up a lot um, was how, and maybe it's because I have a newborn that this popped up for me in my searches a lot, but like it was talking about how cats kill babies, which is not true. Um, but it was like, it originally started as a cat will climb into a crib and suck out a baby's breath. Um, there, I even found that there was a jury in Plymouth that found a cat guilty of infanticide in 1797, but also the 1700s were crazy. So, and I, I vaguely remember, I'll have to look this up too, where at one point they did a um, trial on a pig that had allegedly killed a child um, and they did a trial for a pig. I, I feel like that was a thing. I may have made, just made that up, though. I don't know. But the cat one is true. Um, and they think that the reason the whole, like, the cat sucks out the baby's breath thing and kills them comes from, like, the Renaissance belief that the soul is attached to the body through the lips. This, of course, led me down a bit of a rabbit hole when it comes to souls. So... I'll get more into this later, but it was, you know, believe that cats work for the devil. And um, if you think about like a soul passing away, so if you are, you're looking at the grave and this kind of ties into last episode where we talked a lot about graves and some of the different myths surrounding certain ones. Apparently, if a cat sits on their grave, it means that the person was possessed at some point in their life, which I'm like, okay. It might be that you're of an inviting grave that has some sunspots on it, but whatever. Um, and apparently if there's a cat fight near a grave, it symbolizes the angel versus the demon fighting over the soul, which I'm like, there are cat fights everywhere. So, <laughs> and who works for who? I thought they said that all cats worked for the devil. So which ones are the angel cats and which ones are the demon cats? But it was interesting to see some like theories about souls, how cats relate to souls, both newborn and those who have just passed. So kind of like the beginning and end of a life cycle has some myths about cats surrounding it. So a lot of people um, will say even now, especially in like new witchcraft type stuff, neo-paganism, neo-wicca, um, all that kind of stuff will say how one of the most common familiars is a cat, which I think that's really cute, um, to have like a little cat friend. I actually have, um, a, an episode in mind that explores why, um, witches even to this modern day got their particular kind of look it's very interesting um but I'll have to talk about that in a future episode so that I don't go off on tangents that I'm prone to doing (laughs) but because the cat was tied to witches in a 
benevolent way. Because witches were prosecuted, that's where there was a belief that the cat worked for the devil because it was also assumed that witches worked for the devil, which is just blatantly untrue unless they tie witchcraft to devil worship, but that doesn't necessarily go together. It's a whole thing. But they thought that cats brought souls to hell. Um, Another thing that was related to like breathing in cats is that um, people thought that a cat's breath would infect you with consumption. And that was the old timey word for tuberculosis. They also thought that a cat's bite was venomous. What I think that comes from, I don't know where the tuberculosis one came from, but the thinking that the cat's bite is venomous, um, I think comes from that there's like a high risk for any kind of bite. It doesn't even matter. Actually, I think human bite is the most likely. I'm going to have to fact track myself here, but I to get infected. But I could maybe see like if someone got a cat bite and it got infected or they got cellulitis or something from it, then they would be like, "I've it's poisoned me. <laughs> it sunk its venomous fangs into me. I could just see like the panic coming from something that people can't explain. Unfortunately, because the cats were so, this part's so sad. Ugh, a lot of the stuff I talk about is kind of, kind of tragic, to be honest. But, you know, you wouldn't be here listening to this unless you had this kind of morbid fascination, too. You're a spooky soul, after all. But a lot of um, cats were killed during the Black Plague because people thought that cats were the reason people were getting sick. Um, the Black Plague is also like the other term for it is the bubonic plague. But a lot of us know now that the Black Plague was spread by rats. And it's possible that if they hadn't gone on mass killings of cats, that the cats would have actually helped with the rat control of like the rat population control with their hunting. So that's really sad because not only was it a mass killing of any type of animal, I mean, it makes me sad to think about the rats too. Um, It also was completely in vain. So there's some interesting background for cats regarding holidays. And there were two specific ones that showed up. One was for Yule or, you know, wintertime holidays and the other biggie was for Samhain or Halloween um particularly the Halloween that occurs on October 31st um there was this imagery of something called a cat she and I'm hoping I'm saying that correctly if not I'll actually write out how to how I the name of this creature in the show notes, of course. Um, But this is described as being this large black cat um, that could sometimes walk on four legs, sometimes walk on two. People didn't know if it was fairy related, um, witch related, um, or like demon. Like there's all these kinds of things, basically like a not good creature. That was this large black cat with a white spot on its chest. Um, Honestly, now that I'm saying it out loud, it gives me very cat in the hat vibes. And even though I'm not afraid of cats, I was very much afraid of cat in the hat. And I really never much cared for Dr. Seuss. I know that's like a super unpopular opinion, but some of the rhymes and and storylines and stuff used to freak me out as a kid, which admittedly is not difficult to do. (laughs) Um, But So this cat she would prowl around. Um, Mostly it was on the Scottish Highlands, but it was also like um, some of this mythology uh, was in Ireland as well. And apparently it was looking for souls. And so in some of the wakes, uh, there would be very, very loud music played to distract her from showing up. Also, also... Uh, 
as I'm saying this out loud, why is this malevolent spirit female coded? And also, why are witches typically female coded? Interesting. Just good to think about. Good to think about. Um, but uh, the next, this is why I was thinking about witches, was the next little piece of information was that some people thought that this cat was actually a witch that could shape shift, but it could only do it nine times, which is where that kind of like nine lives comes from too. But it could only do it nine times. And then the ninth time the cat would be stuck in cat form and it would be destined to be a cat she for the rest of its life. During Sawin, she would bless a house that left milk out in a saucer for her to drink and would curse those who didn't. I have two thoughts on this. Um, one, don't give milk to cats. That's not okay. That's not good for cats at all. Um, their bodies can't digest it. It's not good for them. If you have a baby cat, you need a particular kind of cat milk formula, not bovine milk. That's not good. Second, they really just described like the worst trick-or-treaters ever. I mean, I feel like <laughs> it's just like trick-or-treat where it's like, give me a treat or I'll egg your house. But in this case, it's like, give me milk or I will curse your house. Then on the flip side, during Krampus, um, which is celebrated in many different parts of Europe, um, it's kind of like the (laughs) anti-Christmas. There's more to it, way more to it than that. And honestly, I should do an episode around wintertime for Krampus just to like delve into the creepy lore behind that because there's a lot of cool stuff around like winter holidays and how it's celebrated in different countries um but apparently kids that finished their chores before I think it was like midnight of Krampus or Christmas would get clothing as a gift the next day but those who did not do all of their chores would not get clothes and on top of that there was this added awfulness to it that the cat she would try and find them and would eat them um so the kind of rhetoric behind it is that the yule cat is constantly prowling and peering through windows and looking for lazy children to eat which is honestly horrifying like I'm so glad (laughs) that um, I was not exposed to these kinds of things as a kid because one I would 100% believe it like no questions asked (laughs) if if I were a tiny human um, being told this and two I would be absolutely horrified the entire night I would be so anxious I would you cannot do this to anxious children (laughs) some Other themes that I thought was interesting was that cats show up with relation to the weather quite a bit. So it's pretty well known that a lot of sailors would have cats on their ship for vermin control. Um, And they're just like a very self-sufficient, very independent, well, some of them. Kachu is not self-sufficient or independent. I think he would just turn into a cotton ball if left outside um, and blow away. (laughs) He's a little ridiculous um, and not made for outdoors. But the type of like feral or mousing type cats that lived on ships were independent and self-sufficient and they would help the ship in general. So they would use these cats as companions and... um, vermin control but also as a way to tell the weather and some of the legends or the myths behind the cat telling the weather is that clawing curtains which I mean if they have curtains on a ship that's pretty bougie I think that's like a a nice ship maybe it was only in the captain's quarters I honestly don't know a lot about boats I personally had several uh not fun experiences on a sailboat in my childhood and so since then I've just kind of been like and never again so I don't know very much about and I'm also petrified of the ocean um so there's a lot going on where I just would not know information about this but it would be a good future episode idea to delve into like 
maybe sailor folklore or like um, sea monster type stuff. But anyway, before I go down another rabbit hole, if a cat was clawing the curtains, that meant it was going to be very windy or gusty. Um, If the cat's eyes dilated or they sneezed a lot or they were washing their ears, that meant it was going to rain. Um, And some people thought that maybe some of the storms at sea were caused by cats. That particular thought process of maybe the cat is causing a sea storm comes from an old tale about, of course, talking about persecuting witches. (laughs) Um, Apparently, there's an old tale that goes that there was a witch on a sailboat and they thought it was bad luck to have a woman aboard. (laughs) Um, So they did not know she was a witch. She was just existing as a woman because that's a crime. Uh, So they threw her overboard. So she transformed into a cat of the ocean and haunts the seas. Again, (laughs) I have many thoughts on this. One, if this is true, because a lot of times the, the saying goes, you know, there's a little kernel of truth in legends, rumors, things like that. Um, so if there even is an iota of truth in this, I'm horrified. And I, I hope that she still takes down sexist ships. Two, there's a ton of superstition around women, which still shows up in modern day contemporary customs. Um, an example might be like carrying the bride over the threshold of a new home. And that gives me just like another idea of like something to look into about like weird folklore surrounding women in general in a future episode. A third thing that I'm noticing, another thought, is that there's lots of stuff about cats that are projections of like society's views of femininity, which is just so odd to me. But maybe that's part of why all these old stories are incredibly negative. Because honestly, like, I'm super surprised that I didn't find more positive or beloved information. I thought my research would be like episode one, where there were all these folklore and like, even like deities about spiders that were wonderful and hopeful. But like, When it came to cat folklore and myths, it was very, like, negative. So I just did all the negative ones first, which was admittedly most of it. I already know that I'm going to do a future episode where I specifically go out with confirmation bias and only, like, procure information that is positive and benevolent towards cats or, like, feline-type entities. Um, The last little bit of information, which I saved the positive ones for last, (laughs) um, is that in English superstition, it says that a black cat as a wedding gift brings good luck. So I thought that was really cute. Just get like a little black cat friend as a as a good luck charm. And then apparently a cat sneezing near a bride means good luck on her wedding day. So I thought that was cool. Um, a little cat sneeze. Um, I have a cat named after the sound of a sneeze. So maybe I'm super lucky for life. It's really neat too to, to think about it in the idea of luck where black cats are lucky or considered lucky in the UK and in Japan. Um, the Russian blue cats, those are so gorgeous. Um, they do have like a slate grayish blue color. It's very interesting, but they're seen as good luck in Russia. And then here's something that I thought was really cool. Polydactyl cats, like the ones with a bunch of extra toes, are seen as good luck as well. And I didn't realize that because just like um, femininity typically has some negative traits projected onto it, disability has tons of negative traits projected onto it by society. I mean, I'm just going to get on this podcast, be like society every single episode. (laughs) Um, so those are lots of interesting tales surrounding cats. Um, I'm definitely going to do more research and see if there are any cats in like religions or spirituality to have more positive beliefs about them spread on my future episodes. 
And I hope that you have a day filled with luck and good omens. And I'll be here snuggling my little demon spawn. Thanks to all you spooky souls out there for listening to Creepy Core and Folklore. Follow on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok if you're looking for more uncanny content. If you have your own tales to tell, you can email creepycoreandfolklore at gmail.com. If you liked this, please leave a review wherever you get your podcasts or tell a friend who might enjoy these stories to spread the word. If you're interested in dark fantasy, check out my Hollowverse series. Ashes is available now in paperback and ebook on Amazon and audiobook on Audible, and the sequel is underway. I'm Iona Wayland, and I'll see you next time.